So hi everyone. In the last video, we derived these three first order conditions here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to try okay, to derive the implications of these three first order conditions. So again, we have um, we have the first, first order condition, the second, and the third. Okay, so what we're going to do here okay, is we're going to equate lambda equals lambda. Okay, so for we're going to use two and three, and then manipulate it by equate, trying to isolate out lambda. So for two, we get w is equal to lambda uh, times partial f, l, k, partial l. Now, if you notice this one here, we actually know what that is, and that's just equal to MPL, right? So the first order partial derivative of the production function with respect to labor, that's just MPL. So simplifying, we get uh, MPL, and we get uh, lambda is equal to W over MPL. Similarly, if we use 3 now, so we get R is equal to lambda partial F L K partial K. Again, we know what this is. That's just equal to MPK or marginal product of capital. So that's the first order derivative of the production function with respect to capital. Then dividing both sides by MPK, MPK you're going to be left with uh, lambda is equal to r over mpk. So equating lambda equals lambda, k lambda equals lambda. So we get w over mpl is equal to uh, r over mpk. What I'll do now is I'll rearrange it a bit just to get it in a form that uh, I want to isolate things out. So I can rearrange it so I can switch these two. So this is going to be MPK over MPL is equal to R over W. Then I can what I can do is I can also interchange these two. So that's going to be MPK over R is equal to MPL over W. Okay, now let's do the implications of the first order conditions. This first one here, okay, this first first order condition here, that's just equal to Q is equal to FLK. And this gives rise to the first first order condition. And it means that, so it's very simple, it requires that the firm must produce Q units of output. That is, remember, we said here in cost minimization, a firm has this desired level of output that it wants to do. Its goal is to try and get that output while minimizing cost. The first first order condition states that the firm must be able to get that desired output level. And it must be able to produce that much units. So pretty straightforward. The second first order condition, which is born out of these last two FOCs mathematically, is that uh, the marginal product of capital per unit of, uh, 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 per the amount of currency that you spend using that capital should be equal to the marginal product of labor per amount of currency you spend on labor. So what does that mean? It means that in order to minimize cost, the marginal product per unit of currency, so that's per dollar, per peso, what have you. So the marginal product per unit of currency spent on each input should be the same for all inputs. That is, the extra output per extra unit of currency spent on each input are equal. So you have no reason, okay, you have no reason to uh, reallocate your uh your input so what does, what do we mean by that you have no incentive say for example to increase your uh, allocation to labor and decrease your allocation for capital because they would be having equal marginal products uh, their their contribution to output of their marginal product is equal okay and alternatively okay what you'll notice is that uh, I wrote something here okay I can further rearrange this again, okay, so further rearranging this one to, I can get this one into, uh, I can switch these two there, 
So that's going to be MPL over uh, MPK. That's going to be equal to R, uh, W over R. Now, we know this one too from earlier production theory, and that's actually the marginal rate of technical substitution for labor and capital, WR. And essentially, that's your first order condition there too. So these two boxes here are equivalent. Okay. So that is the cost minimizing firm should equate the marginal rate of technical substitution between two inputs to the ratio of the two inputs prices. And what are the prices of the two inputs? Well, they're the wage rate and the rental rate of capital. So again, we have two first order conditions. Okay, so this is FOC2. The first one is that the firm must be able to produce its desired level of output. The second one is that the firm should be able to uh, uh, equate okay, its marginal rate of technical substitution between the two inputs to its input prices. Now, it might seem fluffy for now, but we'll get this soon when we go to a graphical example. So mathematically, okay, if we minimize the cost, so the cost minimizing L and K, so the cost minimizing L and K, if we solve, for example, this Lagrangian optimization process, what we can do is we can obtain an optimal value of labor and an optimal value of capital, okay? And these optimal values will be functions of exogenous variables to the firm's cost minimization process. What do we mean by exogenous? These are things that the firm has no control over. So they will be functions, okay, of things that the firm has no control over. So uh, you have labor hours, your labor hour choice will be a function of wage, rental rate of capital, and your output, as well as your machine hour choice, okay? And we call these two optimal values, okay, the functions that we're gonna derive, it's going to be called conditional, conditional uh, demand functions. You call those conditional demand functions. Essentially, they're, they're like Marshallian demand functions, but this time for uh, production. Or rather, they're actually more like Hicksian demand functions because expenditure minimization is more akin to cost minimization as compared to utility maximization. Now, we can get the two FOCs uh, more clearly if we use a graph. Okay, So let's go to a graph. Uh, let's have a graph. There we go. Now, we have a graph here. Okay, What we have here is this isoquant which represents our desired level of output. Then we're going to introduce a new concept uh, called an isocost, okay? An isocost is these three lines that you see here. And essentially, they're like, uh, they look like budget lines and they function very similarly. So an isocost, okay, an isocost okay, represents, it represents all combinations of L and K, which the total cost are the same. Okay, so what does that mean? Say I have a point here along C1, any point along that line will give you that same cost. Same with C2 and C3. Then the further north, uh, northeast the line is, the higher the cost. That is, C1 is less than C2 is less than C3. Whoops, C3. Then the slope, okay, the slope of each isocost, okay, the slope of each isocost is negative W over R. Okay, why is it negative? Because each isocost line is downward sloping in the K and L space. And uh, graphically, Okay, that's the constraint that the firm has to produce, Q outputs, is represented by the isoquant. Okay? So we have an isoquant okay, here because the firm has to be able to achieve that production target. This is Q star. And we have a set of isocosts here. Okay? And as I said, C3 is a higher cost than C2 and then C1 and so on. Now, we said earlier that one of the first order conditions is that MPK uh, 
over R should be equal to M P uh, M P L over W. Okay, and uh, that's like uh, that's basically attained. Okay, when the slope. Okay, the slope of the isoquant. Isoquant is equal to the slope of the isocost. Okay? Now, if you zero in on that, okay, that happens at this point. Let's call this point, point C. Okay? Now, let's illustrate uh, other points as well. So, let's have point A here. And then point uh, B. Okay? So, we have point A and point B. Now, at point A, at A, so we have, uh, so the, again, the negative of the slope of the isoquant is MRTS, so that's MPL over MPK, and the slope of this is W over R, so let's just say there, uh, since this is, the slope of the isoquant is downward sloping, that's negative, this is negative, if we divide both sides by negative one, it becomes positive, and we are left with this condition here. Now, the slope of the isoquant at A is given by that line there. That we just drew that line there. And the slope of the isocost line is constant for all points along a same uh, isocost, and that's this one. And what you'll notice is that, okay, the slope of the isocost, okay, is flatter than the slope of the isoquant. So this is greater, okay? Then if we sort of manipulate this, that's MPL over uh, W is greater than MPK over R, which means that the marginal product of labor per unit of, um, uh, per amount that you spend on labor is higher than the marginal product of capital per the amount that you spend on capital. So it means that you can opt to reallocate your input combination by adding more and more, by adding more labor. So you notice that A, okay, you employ so much capital, but so little labor. So you can opt to reallocate your input combination to have more laborers, okay? Because they have a higher marginal productivity uh, at A than capital. Similarly, at B, the slope of the isoquant is given as this, okay, that line that we just drew. And the slope of the isocost is given as that. So at B, what you'll notice is that, okay, the isoquant now is flatter than the isocost, which means that MPL over W is less than MPK over R, which means that you can opt to, so the firm, so look, it now over employs labor and under employs capital. So it can opt to reallocate its options or its input combination to include more capital. Now at C, okay, what you notice is that the the slope of the isocost is this one, and it's actually the same as the slope of the isoquant, which is also that one. So at C, MPL over MPK is equal to W over R, which means that the marginal product per uh, of labor per unit of amount that you spend on labor is equal to the marginal product of capital for the amount that you spend on capital, meaning you have no incentive to deviate from that uh, input combination. And what you'll notice is that, look at where point C lies. Point C lies at C2. And we know that C2 is less than C3. Both A and B um, lie on the long, along the isocost at C3. So at point C, when these marginal product, when this ratio became equal, cost is lower. So at point C, you attain the cost minimizing input combinations. Okay, so here you will have K prime, that's the conditional demand for capital. And this one is the conditional demand for labor. And that's uh, how cost minimization works graphically and theoretically.